Good afternoon, everyone. I'm the Reverend Jill Olds, the director of the Yale Youth Ministry Institute here at Yale Divinity School. The YMI is very pleased to welcome all of you to today's webinar entitled Grief. We all feel it, but do you know what to do with it? With Dr. Sue Hoy Lee. This is our second gathering for this year's lecture series, which we've coined Thriving Not Surviving, building a toolkit for a flourishing youth ministry in 2021 to 2022. We're excited to be offering opportunities to hear from speakers who have taken what the past year or two has been and used it to inform and transform their work with young people. In the coming months, we will hear about trauma. We'll hear about sacred story. We will hear about children's ministries. We'll, we will hear from those who have engaged in anti-racism work with youth. Each of our presenters brings a unique perspective and experience and all of them hold a piece to the puzzle that will help us answer the question, how can my youth ministry not just survive, but thrive? We will be virtual for the fall and our hope is to return to hybrid offerings with an in-person component in the spring, pending Yale's protocols for large in-group gatherings from folks coming off from off campus. So please stay tuned as those details unfold. Welcome back to those of you who have joined us before. And a special welcome to all of you who are joining our community for the first time. We are very glad that you are here, that you have found your way to us and that you are sharing of your time and sharing your gifts in this space. For our time today, Dr. Lee will speak to us and we'll conclude with a final Q&A time. Please remain muted throughout the session, but we will also be monitoring the chat window and there will be an opportunity to ask questions there. Feel free to type your questions there at any time. Our office has a great staff. I'd like to introduce you to them quickly and thank them for their work. The Youth Ministry Institute falls under the purview of the Center for Continuing Education at YDS. So we have Kelly Morrissey, the Managing Director for the Center for Continuing Ed. And we're blessed to have Megan Lukens, our Communications Coordinator. Thank you both for all that you do and more importantly, for who you are. If you are new to us, we invite you to peruse our website when you get a chance. That's YaleYouthMinistryInstitute.org. We have a whole array of resources on there. We have curricula for your youth, training modules for youth leaders. We have discussion forums, over 1,000 video clips and lectures given by the world's leading youth ministry experts. We have COVID-19 era resources. We have some tips for resilience with youth, resources for anti-racism work, links to other articles and materials. All of our offerings are available for free as part of our mission to give you what you need. So please do check out our website when you get a chance. We also want you to mark your calendars for upcoming events. Our next offering for this school year will be on Wednesday, November 3rd at noon, at which time we will welcome Dr. Margaret Clark to this space. Dr. Clark is a social psychologist who will speak to us about belonging in youth ministry and about the importance of emotionality when working with young people. Please do consider joining us then. And that will be on Wednesday, November 3rd. A link to that can be found, that registration can be found on the website, in our email newsletter and in our chat window. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce you all to Dr. Lee. Dr. Su Hui Lee currently serves as the Director of Counseling and Psychological Services at Phillips Exeter Academy, providing individual psychotherapy, crisis intervention, triage, and short-term skills groups trainings to boarding and day students. A clinical psychologist with over a decade of research and experience with young people, particularly those in boarding school populations, Dr. Lee holds an appointment as a clinical instructor at Harvard Medical School and was the inaugural course director of the Multicultural Training Seminars at McLean Hospital out of Harvard Medical School. As if that were not enough, Dr. Lee also routinely provides workshops in the treatment, on the treatment of anxiety disorders, both locally and internationally, most recently conducting trainings for parents and clinicians in China and Japan. Dr. Lee, welcome. We are so honored to have you and I'll let you take it from here. Well, 
Hello, everyone. Thank you. Uh, it's such an honor and pleasure to be here with all of you. Thank you to the uh, for your invitation. Uh, I want to say thank you for the introduction. And it's always funny because speakers are the one that you know provide the introduction. So <laughs> it's it's always a kind of a strange, awkward thing, and strange to hear yourself being in that way. Um, but again, uh, I hope that you find our time. To valuable and interesting and and really this should be a conversation uh, and my hope is to kind of go through my presentation and leave lots of time in the end for us to just converse about how how we help young people with grief and loss and how we attend to our own experiences and feelings of grief and loss so take me a minute give me a minute to share my screen here so bear with me I'm hoping everybody can see that, okay. Great. So the topic today is about grief and loss. And in fact, we all do experience it, but what do we do? And I just wanna make a quick extinction, uh, this distinction, because I, I, I know that Joe mentioned that there will be some talk about trauma. When I think about the difference between grief and loss and trauma is that grief and loss are natural parts of life. It's something that we will experience, we expect to experience, not that the expectation makes it any easier, but it is a natural part of life. Trauma is not. Trauma is something that isn't supposed to happen. It's not part of life. We have to deal with that and go through that. So I just want to be really clear about what we are talking about today. And if I think about, you know, what does grief mean? Well, it's a deep sorrow, it's an emotion that is a specifically caused by a sense of a, a loss that's experienced. Traditionally, when we talk about grief, we're really thinking about a loss of someone. But what we know, and boy, do we know it, especially the last 18 months, is that loss really can encompass a lot of different things, not just loss of a person we love, the loss of something we care deeply about. It can be a loss of aspects of our, it can be a loss of routine. <laughs> you know, COVID-19, the pandemic has done such a number to all different ways. And I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. Um, but we've all experienced some loss. I know for me, uh, when, when the pandemic hit, I felt like I lost a sense of my professional self. Suddenly my children were home a lot. <laughs> and I needed to parent them and manage work at the same time. And it was so confusing, so unsettling. And that was a loss for me, loss of my professional identity. I think motherhood did that to me too, but that's maybe a whole separate conversation. I feel like I've needed to reconnect of who, as, who I am um, as there's been a big change in my life. So when I think about the impact of the pandemic in the last 18 or so months, I think about loss. And certainly the pandemic did in fact cause loss of loved ones, but there's also just loss of our routine, loss of our coping skills. How many of us weren't able to see family and friends engage in activities that we once enjoy and all of that were taken away from us. Um, and we've had to do a lot of regaining um, in this process. There's a photo, there's a picture that I'd like to share and is this that you see in front of you. When I think about something like the pandemic and I think about loss and grief in general, as I said, it is a natural part of life and even the pandemic can be something that we experience. But the truth of the matter is that we are all different ships in the same storm experiencing a very different journey. How the storm impacts you, how the storm has impacted me, can be very, very different depending on who we are, our resources, how strong we were feeling going into the storm, what access we have to support, all of that. When we talk about loss and grief and you're working with young people and even adults, I think it's important to just pause and assess what has this been like for them and give them an opportunity to share with you what it's been like for them and that you're not making any assumptions and certainly not assumptions based on how it's been for you. Um, 
and certainly not assumptions based on what you see at first glance. As a clinician, um, I remember working with folks with grief and loss before I experienced a significant loss of my own, which is a death of my father 15 years ago. And I often think back to the way I counsel people pre-15 years, you know, before my father passed, and how little I really knew about grief and loss, because I myself had not experienced it. And I really leaned on them to tell me their story, which was great, but there was still something that might have been missing. Since my dad's passing, I feel like I have more of an empathetic year of what loss, loss and grief can feel like, but wanting to also make sure that I'm not imposing my own journey of grief and healing upon somebody else. So again, I, I, I like this picture. I'm a very visual person. Um, so I hope that this is a moment to just pause and think about getting somebody's story and recognizing what it's been like for you as you're the, in the helper seat. I'm gonna take a moment and share a, a video with you all. And I, I don't know how many, and I, this is where I wish it was live, you know, we were in person, cause this is when I'll have, I'll have you raise your hand. How many of you have watched this, the movie Frozen, Frozen 2? Those of you have young kids may have, or this is a heavy repeat in your car. I have a five-year-old and a two and a half-year-old and I, I'm all frozen out. <laughs> but there is a song in Frozen 2 that I don't think my children pay attention to, but I did. And it's a song that I thought, oh my gosh, this is perfect for that talk I have to give. <laughs> and so I ask you to humor me for a bit as I share this with you all. I'm only going to share a portion of this, and then um, we'll come back and talk. Hopefully you're able to hear the first part of that song. I'm curious what folks are thinking as they heard that song and the lyrics to the song. Are there folks things that people want to put in the chat even now of kind of what came to mind? Accurate, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, in that br Yes, this is great. Thank you so much, everyone, for using this chat function. You know, I, I, I have to give the writers of the song some credit. <laughs> and again, an animation, the power of animation is that I think in just a few minutes, it really described what grief can feel like. And I think especially for young people, it can feel heavy. It can feel like it's gravity pulling you down. It can feel, and they will say that I've lost a sense of hope. I cannot see beyond this. And again, we're talking about young people. We're talking about young people where their emotions are raw. That's part of why we love them and part of why they drive us nuts, right? Their emotions are raw. And they're also at the very beginning stages of learning about how to cope with their raw emotions. And that's part of why I love being a psychologist, working with this age group, because I get to help them navigate those challenging emotions and learn some coping skills. But when grief and loss hits, it can feel dramatic, it can feel heavy, it can feel like your complete world has changed. And remember what I said earlier in the beginning of this talk, it doesn't even have to be about death. It's a loss. And kids can talk about that with loss because of moving, loss of friendship, loss of routine, loss of any sort that the, that the young person feels, it is that dramatic, it is that heavy. We're just gonna, I'm looking at the chat just to make sure I got, thank you for using that space and thank you for trusting that space. Uh, and I'm sorry, Catherine, for your loss. I'm gonna try to share the next slide here. 
those of you who worked um, in this field probably have heard, you know, that there's these stages of grief. And we, you've also heard the next breath, which is it doesn't work in stages. <laughs> we used to think that psychologists love proposing models and thinking that, okay, you go through denial, then you go through anger and bargaining and depression to finally acceptance. And then we know like, oh my gosh, that none of that works because human emotions are more up and down. And sometimes you can go through denial and anger and bargaining and find yourself back to denial again, that these stages do not build upon one another, that they are just ways to organize and understand where you are at in that moment. But I do think it's important to have some of these names of, you know, and, and it normalizes it a little bit for young folks who may be experiencing grief and loss for the first time. And having a model can normalize it. Having some language to frame how they're feeling can normalize it and make it less scary. I think part of what happens with young folks, again, emotions are raw, that whatever they're feeling maybe for the first time in such an intense way, it can feel very scary as in that video, that weight of it all, you can feel like it's gonna pull you down forever. And again, for young folks, their timeline is very much now, never, or forever, right? That they don't have enough uh, lived experiences like you and I, just mere fact of living life and age, that they can reference to and say, well, the last time I, ha I lost somebody or something, this is what happened. For them, if it's the first time, it's going to be quite scary. So I put this up to just say, you know, remind all of us that there are these different points of one's grief and healing um, that will be important to talk about with a young person. What I like to talk about along with, you know, there are these stages that somebody proposed and where you think you might be right now, is I talk about waves. I talk about grief that it's like an ocean wave that when it comes, sometimes it comes so big that it feels like it's gonna wash over you, right? And it's scary, you feel like you're drowning in it, you don't know how to surf or swim, then it's gonna feel really scary. And I always tell young people, like a wave, is subsides. And part of your job is to figure out how to ride out the wave. We can't avoid it. Right? We just talked about in the beginning that grief and loss is a natural part of life. So trying to avoid it actually can be rather maladaptive. Some folks who try to avoid grief also means that they don't take chances in relationships and attachment, right? So trying to get rid of it, nah, not a good idea. Trying to ride it out and learning coping skills and accept it. Wave is nice and big, but it will subside can be a healthy approach to understand grief. As I think about my own grief for the loss of my, fa my, my father a few years ago, you know, it comes in waves and sometimes a little ripple. <laughs> and other times it feels like crashing down, like it's happening for the first time. And it doesn't mean that I'm back to where I was 15 years ago, right? It just means it's a different part of this journey. And I, and I, and I stress that because I also hear from young people the frustration when the grief comes back. Well, I thought I already got over that. Or I thought I was fine. Well, I thought I you know, already talked through it and cried it out. Why am I upset today? Well, another wave came. How do we be more gentle and kind in understanding how this happens? And again, the goal is not to get rid of. The goal is to understand and write it out. I've mentioned some of this already, but I'll go through some of it again. Particularly for young folks, they have not had a lot of lived experiences and that can include dealing with loss. For a lot of our young folks, the pandemic might've been their first loss, right? What the pandemic took away from them, routine, French school, sports, you name it. That might've been their first time experiencing that loss. Um, so it's good to remind ourselves of that especially if we are reacting to their strong emotions and not understand like, what's the big deal? <laughs> well, deal for them. As I said, this may be the first time they're experiencing the emotions. This may be the first loss they've had to endure. And for young folks, it may lead to an existed, existential crisis. 
What is life? What is death? What happens next? This is, and again, all of this is developmentally appropriate. Really hard to make sure young folks understand not to pathologize any of this and for the adults in their lives to not pathologize any of this. When you have a loss, when you have, especially loss by death, you do start to question, right? Like what, what is living? What is death? What is life after death? Uh, and this is when I do a lot of partnership in my work with folks such as yourselves and think about, are there spiritual advisors we can invite in to help us with some of those conversations? Do we include parents in some of those conversations? Because what you don't want is to have some of these little conversations alone, get them to leave your office, right? And then get a whole different message at home and from their other trusted circles. So this is when it's really good to partner. And I love leaning on spiritual advisors to help guide us in some of this, because I have my blind spots and I may have my own experiences of how I lean on my faith through my, my um, grief process. But that doesn't mean that's how this young person is gonna do it uh, for themselves. There's some myths out there about how to grieve. And here are some, I'm just gonna run through some slides of what don't do, <laughs> the do's and don't, and we'll start with the don'ts. Ever heard the phrase, time will heal? I used to say that, <laughs> guilty, pre-15 years ago, before my big loss. I used to say that, because that's what I thought you'd say. And I remember reading, you know, a school and, and whatnot when I got my doctorate degree that like, yeah, like time will heal, right? So, okay, that's the right thing you say. So you say that. And I'm so sorry <laughs> to those that I've said that to. What the heck was I? You know, what was I thinking? I think my intention at the time was to give reassurance, to acknowledge the pain and acknowledge that there is a way to find some relief. Time will heal. It puts a time frame to it. It, it puts an end to it. And I think what I was trying to do is convey hope to somebody who may be feeling hopeless. So I get it. But here's why it was not a good idea, Sahoy. <laughs> <laughs> is that it falsely assumed that there's an end of the grief experience. And remember, I just got done saying that they're like ocean waves, sometimes ripples, sometimes big, you know, big waves. So to assume that time will heal assumes that waves will stop. That's not my understanding of grief. To say time will heal, I think also unintentionally minimizes the pain that simply time is the only remedy. We just gotta wait it out. So I think about intention and I think about impact. And so my intention might've come from a space of wanting to help, which was, but my impact from 15 years ago might've been um, by negative. And I think in some ways, and, I, and now that I'm thinking more about it too, that it doesn't only uh, imply that time is simply the remedy, but that you're almost like victim to it. You just sit and wait it out. Whereas a lot of what I do with clients is how do you ride out the wave? What are some things you can do to make the riding of the wave easier? Not just a simple recipient of the darn wave and let it crash over you and just handle it. But that's not, that's not what we want kids to think um, is the approach. I'm not able to watch the chat box as I'm going through this, but if there are reasons for me to stop, if there's something, please let me know. Um, there's also this idea of like, you got, you got to find closure. And I, and I think that's particularly for death by, um, loss by death, grief uh, of a, a death, a loss by death. That's a closure. Um, and I think the intention behind that is that it provides a goal. All right, what you gotta do is find closure. It also provides a solution at the end. Once you achieve closure, then you'll be done. This often is shared, especially when we're talking about sudden death, unexpected, or that um, 
a person didn't like the, the last conversation they had with this person before they were gone, something like that. There's something that isn't right. Um, and so we might say, well, you want to have some closure to that. That will help you grieve. The impact of that, though, is that it assumes that all of us are able to achieve a satisfactory end. Can we do that? <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, again, using my own example, I, and again, not to overshare, my father passed away 15 years ago. It was through an illness. We very much knew it was coming. He went to hospice for seven days. I spent the last night with him, talked to him, blah, blah, blah. I, in some ways, feel like, wow, I got to say goodbye. I was able to be with him for his last breath. What a gift that was for my dad to me, and the family was around him. But I still won't say that was a satisfactory end. I have my closure, right? I got to talk to my dad and say all the things I want to say. He got to say what he wanted to say. Blah, 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 blah. I have closure. But that doesn't mean that I can, it was satisfactory. I still lost him, right? Saying that you'll find closure and then something, the grief will be over also assumes a linear journey that you kind of have to get to this point and it's done. And again, you, you, I'm hitting this over your head now, <laughs> that it's not done. It just comes in different ways. All right. Has anybody ever told you you just got to cry it out? Let it out. Give it a good cry. And I've had young people refer to me because they've had a loss and their parents will say they haven't cried. They need to cry. And we want them to come and talk to you so they can cry. And I always think, okay, what's the intention behind that? Again, a goal. We human beings love goals. We love to achieve goals. And we feel that if we can achieve a goal, then there's a solution and there's an end. All right. And as, I think as a parent, when you're feeling at loss, how to help your child, you might feel like, okay, if I can just help them, get to a therapist and cry it out. Ha! <sighs> Because they're not doing it with me. They got to do it with somebody, right? But again, the impact is that the, you assume that the emotion is a one-time release. Once you cry, it is over and it's done. I remember how I said that sometimes young people have that assumption and they get frustrated when they get triggered or they get frustrated if they're crying again. Of course you're crying again. It's okay. It wasn't a one-time release. And assume that there's a, why, a, a right way to grieve. You've got to cry it out. And again, that linear journey, just like the stages of grief, I think is a very dangerous approach to understanding how to um, write out the ways of grief. Here are some things that are good to do. At a time of loss and grief, it's important to keep some, sort, so, uh, some form of normalcy. Structure and routine can help. Rituals in this situation can be very, very grounding. And I think if we look at different faiths, different faiths have their own rituals around what happens when there's a loss. I'm going to share a little bit of my own experiences with that in just a bit. It's important to provide young people, and I think this applies to adults as well, uh, to have a sense of control and predictability. I work at a high school. And um, this is often a question. When there's a big event on campus, it could be because of loss or grief or some, something happened on campus that's been hard on the young people. Do we cancel classes? That often comes up, right? And folks might say, well, yes, we do. This is how important we think this is and we need to address it as a community. Yes, absolutely, cancel classes. And that makes me nervous. <laughs> Because we're assuming everybody in our community needs the space the same way. And when I think about, uh, so I, I often am in the one in the room that says, I don't think we should cancel classes. Some kids need that routine, that structure, also that permission to keep going about their day. So don't touch the structure and the routine and the predictability of what they're used to, because that can actually help to ground them. But put in flexibility. If a student says, I can't get to class today because I'm feeling the weight of whatever it is, okay, no problem. Here's where you can go to get some support. 
here are counseling services, here are where your advisors will be, here are some open forms that we're going to create to have community gather. Here's, you know, our, our, our church where you can go and, and, and talk with somebody, right? Protect structure and predictability, build in flexibility and nimbleness to respond. Does that make sense? And again, I go back to everybody experiences differently. So you've got to provide the space for folks to pick and choose what they need that day. What they need that day may be very, very different than what they need tomorrow. What they need tomorrow may be different than what next week feels like. And so I'm always a proponent of keeping the structure, keeping the routine, and keeping your support resources ongoing. Not a one-off, but a built-in resource that kids can get to if and when the need comes, if and when the wave comes. Because if, if a community gathering is a one-off, what about the kids who weren't able to get, get there that day, don't feel emotionally ready to get there that day, didn't want to <laughs> talk about it anymore that day, right? People can be in different places. So it's important to keep some normalcy and build in flexibility. As you know, the power of peer voice and the power of peer support in this time of their lives is huge. You and I can say the same things to them, but if their friends say it, it means a lot more <laughs> just because it comes from the youth voice. Really allow for peer support because we know that for adolescents, this is important. As parents, as adults, if we can help to facilitate opportunities for social connection, it really can demonstrate our willingness, our care and our attempts to try to understand that we don't have to be it, but let me get you to, ple to, to folks or places that could be helpful for you. So, you know, the, for adolescents, it's a little too, they're too old to call it playdates. My kids still call it playdates. <laughs> but if somebody's having a hard time, might it be good to get some of the kids together? You know, like I'll drive you or why don't we create this? Would that be helpful? Always checking in with a young person to see, is this something that you might want? And can I help you make that happen? I don't have to stay. I don't have to be there. You and your friends do this, but I can buy you all dinner. I can do the driving. I can right? demonstrate, demonstrate care and understand. When I think about grief and healing, I think a lot about connecting. That is not necessarily about closure, is not necessarily about um, uh, something that you just kind of do, but it's really about how do you stay connected, connected with the, the person you lost, connected with what if the loss is, right? Um, if it's a person, how to stay connected with that person. If it's a routine, if it's a identity, how do you stay connected with that? Um, it is, and how do you connect with other people who are either going through the same thing as you are um, or can, can relate and understand? Um, I'll use an example. So as a young mom, first time mom, not young in age per se, but just new mom, um, it was really, really helpful to have mommy groups for me because I felt like there was a loss of identity when I became a mother. <laughs> I was no longer Sohoi, I was Alex's mom or Emma's mom, right? And being able to be with other people that allowed me to connect with, uh, with that was so grounding, realizing, healing, uh, and not crazy making, right? Um, when I lost the sense of professionalism because of pandemic, getting together with colleagues that were like, oh my gosh, my kid just like totally bombed the, you know, showed up in another Zoom meeting of mine and say, oh my God, me too. And wasn't that awful and embarrassing? You get to connect. So you don't feel so alone in the emotions and frustrations that you feel. When I'm working with young people, I always ask them to think about ways that they can connect, connect with themselves, connect with other people, connect with the loss. Um, and you can do that in so many different ways. And these are just, you know, four ideas, but writing down memories. I've had 
folks kind of really dive into making family photo books and genealogies and think about really like, you know, how you continue on the story, the family story. How do you uh, get celebrate someone's life? That's been often really fun and healing for someone. Talking and praying to the deceased, if it is someone that you've lost because of death, how do you continue those conversations? I talk to my dad all the time. And I think I know what he's going to say, you know, uh, and that's really fun because I would hate to think that that my last chance to talk to him was 15 years ago. I talk, I have so much more stuff to tell him about, right? So many more questions. And, and so I continue to talk to him and I continue to pray to him. And, and that's important for me. And I'm talking to my children about their grandfather who they never met, right? How to get them connected with him and the stories of, of our upbringing and our identity as Taiwanese individuals as immigrants to this country, like all those stories had a key player in it. He's not here anymore, but boy, we have to reference him, right? So how do you continue those conversations and continue the connecting? And you, you've heard this phrase, nothing that I'm coining here, it's like, how do you create a new normal? And part of that is understanding that the waves will come and that's okay. And how do we manage it? How do we create new routines around it? How do we accept it? Um, and how do we move forward? Um, so let me think. I want to uh, see how I can frame this. Uh, so I, I, I'm Buddhist, and I lean a lot of my own process with my Buddhist beliefs and rituals. My, my, my community, my upbringing is full of these rituals. And I didn't really understand them until I think I have more of my adult brain on and my psychologist brain on. But I remember several years ago, my grandmother passed and in Taiwan. And I flew back to Taiwan with my family. And you know, we got there a day or two late because international travel. And one of the first things I remember is sitting down in this great huge um, table with my aunts. And they said, fold this. And so my job all of our jobs around this big round table was to fold something very similar to what you see. It's like a lotus flower. And we just made these lotus flowers. It was like an origami session. <laughs> and we just made, that's all we did for a whole day. We just sat around, food will come, somebody, you know, an aunt will come and bring some food, a cousin will come. And we just, we just made them. And this pile got bigger and bigger. And through the origami making, people were talking about grandma laughing about something silly, right? It was, there was just, and I, and I remember sitting around that table and saying, oh, I get why we're doing this. <laughs> I get it because I've seen those rituals before when I was younger um, and it was just part of life. But I, it was this aha moment of like, oh, we're healing right now. I get it, got it, thank you. You know, we're doing something purposeful. We are coming together in sharing and we're keeping our hands busy. And what all the lotus flowers went was to grandma. These were our offerings to her. In the Buddhist belief is, you know, you, what you see here is paper. You burn paper money to the disease and kind of, um, this is how you show your respect and love. And same thing with the lotus flowers. We burn them all. So this huge pile of origami paper, lotus flowers, all went when, um, to her funeral and we all walked the burn together, all for her. And so it was like, oh, I get it now. Because when you lose something, especially a loved one, as you know, you can feel very helpless. Like what's there to do? What can we do? And in this origami session, I felt like we were doing something. We were doing something together. We were doing something for her. And I take pieces of that to inform my work um, with young people now. When we have a loss of some sort in the community, how do we give young people something to do? Something to do together. Could it be writing of cards? Could it be, you know, Several years ago, we had a, a loss because illness. 
and kids were feeling really kind of antsy and helpless about what do we do? What do we do? We gather up, for, you know, we provided a, a place. It was at the church where there would be cards, stationary, you know, envelopes. And we just had a station there all the time where kids knew that they can go in their own time, write a card to the family, write a card, to, right? And, they, and that we will make sure it gets it, we get it to the family. So you're providing resources. It's predictable. It's not a one-off. It's always there. And kids have something that they feel like they can do. If it's helping kids channel to different um, efforts on campus, that can also ground young people and give them something to do and something to do together. Connecting as a community, how do we help each other out? So I take pieces of that and I think, okay, I get it. Okay, this is grief. This is healing. Okay. And so in your own work with young folks, how do you draw from pieces that make sense to you and offer it all and see what, where it lands for the young person? I'm going to show you this clip again. I am going to the beginning, which you've already seen. And I'm going to let the song play out. And I'm going to see you on the other side and then you, we can talk about what you think. Sorry, technology here. Okay. Want to go to the chat? Tell me a little bit of some reactions or thoughts. Feel free to type in any of thoughts to um, in the chat. One step, one hour, one day. Yep, not focusing too much ahead, taking small steps. Yes. I've listened to this song several times, and I feel like every time I hear it, I, I, I get a little something else from it and really appreciate kind of the, the writer, what they are trying to communicate. And this big moment of like, nothing's gonna be the same again. And not but, and I'm gonna do the next right thing. Now, me being me, I'm like, next right thing? Well, who's the, you know, who decides what's right? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's just the next best thing, you know? Use a word however you like and uh, what makes the most sense. But I love the idea of not looking too far ahead. And I think for young people, remember their time frame: now, never, or forever, right? That there's big, big time frames that they work with. And we have to teach them to go, no, 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 no. What is it right now? We just got to get there today, right? We have got the, let's come up with a plan for tonight. Let's come up with a plan, come up with a plan for this weekend. Right, really reminding young folks to recalibrate their sense of time. Otherwise, it is going to feel overwhelming. Otherwise, it is going to feel um, like it's going to wash over them. And it also feels like it's never ending. And that can feel scary. All right. Let's see if I can get to the next slide here. So, what is all this about? <laughs> Well, I like this image, as you know now about me, I like visual stuff. Um, when we think about individual waves, we can feel the crash of it at times. And the, the goal is to ride it out and understand that even with ripples, even with waves that come, that if we have the support, we have the tools, we keep at it, that we can also pan back and look at the, sun, the sunset, right? And that's what I remind young people. I remind myself when grief hits us particularly hard and a sense of loss is hitting us particularly hard. Just take a moment to look at that. Any of us are having a, a, a wild and crazy day. <laughs> and if you haven't had a chance to even catch your breath yet today, just take a moment to check in. And I do that mindfully and purposefully. Because to do this work that we do, often we forget to ask, how are we doing? 
How are we managing it all? And you've heard this phrase before, right? You can't pour from an empty cup. How's your cup looking these days? Uh, you, you, you all will participate in a different conversation about trauma, as we talked about, and uh, trauma-informed care. And what I always remind ourselves is about trauma-informed care, kind of the 101 of trauma-informed care is that the helper has to be okay. If the helper is not okay, you can do unintended harm on those that you help. For about five years post passing, I, I couldn't take any referrals that had to do with grief and dying. It was too hard. It was too much of my own stuff showing up. It was too much of my own that I think I still needed to, to work through. And I, was not a, I would not have been a good therapist. Uh, for any person at that time. And I needed to know that. And I needed to have colleagues remind me that that was okay, to give myself permission to say, not right now. I may get back to this work, but not right now. But call me about depression or call me about anxiety or call me about, you know, I'm good with those. But if you're coming to me, if you're needing somebody to help you with the grief, particularly of a family member, not right now. And that's important for us helpers to pause and recognize and give ourselves permission to do. And when we are ready and we are able to, we'll get right back into it. And I, you know, again, I guess you should ask my, ask my clients, but I, I firmly believe that I am a better therapist now, having gone through what I've gone through and taken a break from some of this work to do my own work to now be in the helper seat, stronger, um, a little bit firmer. Um, so just a check of how are you all doing? And I'm noticing the time, and I think the time is kind of where I was hoping we would be at, is that we can now gather together and talk uh, together and have questions and answers. And let's look at the chat box and what folks have shared and let's share out. I, I think there would have been some maybe resources or even links that people have. Let's share out, you know, what have worked, what's been um, important in your work with young folks through Groove and So I'm gonna stop sharing my slide so I can see all of you. <laughs> Thank you very much for this time. Dr. Lee, thank you so much for all of this. We are so delighted. Um, I noticed one question show up in the chat and folks at this time, please do feel free to pop them in there and keep an eye on them and, and field them over to Dr. Lee. So a question that came up was, is it okay to say, I know what you're going through? I have some thoughts on that, but I'd love to hear what you think. Um, for young people, <laughs> Because again, we gotta think about our audience here, all right? Um, the minute an adult says, "I know, <laughs> I know what you're going through," there's a little of like, "That's gonna we might get back just because the adolescents." Um, I wonder if we could say something like, "I think I know what you might be going through," or, you know, what I hear from you is sadness. I remember feeling sad when I right. And so it's not about, I know how you feel, but more, I know something about this thing, sadness. And I, I like the word think, because it opens up for them to say, yeah, but it's actually like this. Okay, well, tell me more. But you're not assuming authority. You're not assuming expertise. You are trying to communicate I might have had a taste of something similar, but tell me more about what you're thinking and what you're experiencing, and let's see where we can connect. Leave yourself a little bit of an out. Is what. <laughs> what about you, Jim? What do you think? What are, What were your thoughts? I tend to think, and this is a it's a tough topic in the in the sense that a number of us have gone through life experiences and we want to be able to use those as a means of connection rather than a hindrance. Um, and there's a, there's a fine line there. Um, but to name that we, even if 
So Dr. Lee, a, a point of, of personal connection, my father died about 14 years ago. Our journeys, even though that same connection is there, our journeys are not the same. We may have experienced those deaths completely differently. There may be echoes um, and there may be similarities, but there will certainly be differences in the journey because I'm not Dr. Lee, I'm not you, right? So I think there's, there's something to be said for attempting a connection to say this, some of what you're saying sounds familiar, but I wanna hear more where you are and mm -hmm. they, letting people and young people in particular know that, that they are unique individuals and giving them the space for that is something that I think is really important rather than assuming that, that someone's experience is the same as someone else's. But it's tough to do because we want to make that connection. I think those of us in this field innately want to do that. Um, but sometimes allowing space for the person to reflect more makes that connection in a deeper way. Yeah. Does that make, does that sound about right? Yeah. yeah. You know, and I think um, a lot of us are, are in this, in the positions and seats that we, and who we are, we like to teach. <laughs> we like to impart wisdom. Um, and sometimes we can't help ourselves. Right? We, we want to teach. We want to share. We want to educate. And da, da, da. Sometimes we have to remember that not every moment is a teachable moment. And it may just be a moment to connect and to listen and to hear what there's the story is saying. Um, yeah. But I, I know I have to bite my tongue sometimes because I get so excited about like, oh, my God, I, I have something to tell you. Um, but it really is, it's not about me, is it? It's about them. Yeah, someone in the chat mentioned holy listening in this conversation. Yeah. And uh, another person, thank you for this, said it's not dissimilar to the image shared earlier, different boats, same storm, which is a really, really helpful image. Another shifting gears slightly, another question came up in the chat. Um, are there any particular resources that you would suggest to lead groups of young people through loss, especially around the topic of the pandemic? Mm. Gosh, I think there are lots of resources. I'm happy to send some you know, books that folks can read if that would be helpful. I could, but Joe, I'll send it your way and you can just um, share out. Um, I go back to some of the guiding principles that I shared earlier about the do's and don'ts. Um, and sometimes our job is just to create that space and let it organically go and be okay with that. You know, my brain loves agendas, worksheets, topics, and things to check off. I, that makes me feel good. <laughs> but when it comes to grief and grief groups, I need to remind myself that it's not about a checklist and a, and a worksheet and a da, da, da. it's about how do I help hold this safe space and listen to what the students are needing in my work, the students in high school or the, the young person, young people, and then be ready to respond to their needs. So if you hear the kids organically saying like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we, okay, how can I help that happen? Wouldn't it be nice if we would, okay, how do I make that happen, right? But it may not be my job to have all the answers. And actually, again, adolescents, they may not want my suggestions. And it's gonna be a lot more powerful if it comes from them and they generated it and the peers came around to it. That's gonna have much more traction than something that's imposed, especially when it comes to grief. If I'm running an anxiety group, if I'm running a, time management group. Oh, I got all kinds of worksheets and this is what we need to do, right? Well, grief, I, I, I think it has a special, we have to be a little bit more um, flexible with it, um, particularly with the pandemic. So much was taken from the kids and us too. Frankly, this thing has been hard for us adults uh, and trying to hold it together for our young kids, right? Um, so, so much has, um, been taken, but to give them back some sense of agency can be really, really good. That makes total sense. Thank you so much. 
Folks, uh, lots of questions are coming into the chat. We have a good amount of time left, but I want to name and just uh, put a pin in this. Um, if we don't get to your question, I have the unique privilege of getting a chance to talk with Dr. Lee separately in a separate interview. So if I don't get to your question here, I will absolutely get to it in a subsequent session. I will get those answers to you. But let's, we have a few, so let's, let's start rolling. Um, a question related to what you were just naming, actually. What behaviors or words cause you serious concern to um, a youth's well-being? What, what raises your antenna in that way? A um, couple of things that comes to mind. And I want to reference the, the, the topics that I shared. Healing through connection. But if you have a young person who is adamant about not connecting. They don't wanna to talk to you. They don't wanna to talk to their parents. They don't wanna to talk to their friends. They are starting to isolate, disconnect. To me, that's a warning sign. That's a flag. So, and again, and you watch for it, right? We, we don't expect people to be ready to connect right at the point of loss. But if it's been offered in some time, you know, a day, a week or so, and this person is still insistent on no, don't come near, I don't want to go, I don't want to talk, they're canceling things, they're not any opportunity for connection, late shut down, that will worry me, behavioral-wise. When it comes to words, I think about a lot of um, questions about life and death and about point. Why do we, uh, but not in a inquisitive way, but in a, what is the point of living if we're all just going to die? And what's the point? Like, no one's going to care. Nobody's going to remember. No one's going to, you know, I can die and nobody. When you start to feel like they're talking more about themselves in that there is not a sense of purpose and not a sense of drive. And again, it goes hand in hand to the no connecting. That will worry me. And these would be the same signs and war warning signs that we see, uh, we would look for when we're assessing suicidality, right? Is a person thinking about death or is a person feeling they're hopeless and helpless and out of options? Is a person not feeling attachment and connection with people in their lives that they say, yeah, I don't know what would stop me. I'm a burden to everybody. So what's the point? Does I should be better off for everybody, right? When you start to hear language like that, then that would concern me. If it starts to impact their functioning for a prolonged period of time, so not just a week or two out of classes, they just have not been able to go to school for a month. They've not been able to eat. They've not been able to play their favorite sport for weeks on end. They have not been, right, they, their functioning is now impacted. That will worry me. And those would be wonderful times to refer them to seek um, counseling, to have them be assessed and evaluated and make sure that they're safe. Thank you, that's really helpful. This is a related uh, question and it's around the theme of hope. How does hope connect to grief? Um, how do we find hope and what role does it play in this conversation? Because I, and I'll name my bias on this. I think there's a tendency for us to, to jump very quickly to hope, especially as people of faith, because that's a part of our identity. But how do we find ways to connect hope and grief in a really authentic way? Um, sometimes I think about um, the if hope is a feeling, and oh my gosh, we can have a whole other conversation about that, right? Let's think of in, in what I'm about to say, and let's treat hope as an emotion, as a feeling that we. I think it's dangerous when we set a feeling as a goal. I'll add more to that. When I work with depressed individuals, their treatment goal is, I want to feel happy. Well, we can try. We're going to try. But if that's the only measure of success here, it may be a long journey. What if happiness was a byproduct of us working on other things? Like living a value-driven life. 
You doing things that give you a sense of purpose. You doing things that give you a sense of accomplishment. You doing things that makes you feel good. And, and you're doing these because you like it. And by doing the things that gives you a sense of value and purpose, I think happiness kind of comes. And even if happiness doesn't come, you're doing things that are of value to you, purposeful to you, important to you. You get what I'm saying? So happiness is, shouldn't be a treatment goal. It should be a byproduct of you living your best life. And I think about the same thing with hope. Hope isn't just going to come on to us one day. Ta-da! At least I haven't been able to achieve that. <laughs> I haven't had those like, oh, there's hope. Got it. You know, <laughs> it kind of shines on me on a given day. But hope comes along the way. When I'm sitting, you know, doing my job with, across this room with a young person, they have an aha moment. I'm like, oh, I am doing something helpful, you know? Or I look at my kids and they do something. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm not so terrible of a mom. They're not going to need therapy the rest of their lives. But, you know, like maybe just periods of their life and they'll blame it all on me, but that's okay. You know, but, but doing the things that we love and are purposeful, intentional, valuable, and we get to define what that is. Everybody gets to define it. The byproduct then is hope. The byproduct then is happiness. The byproduct then is, right? So I don't know if that answers the question, but <laughs> hope isn't just going to shine upon us all the time. Yeah, and I like the idea of um, finding hope through purpose. Um, and not letting the uh, not letting feeling dictate where we're where we're heading. That was I really appreciate that. This is a question from one of our attendees. Uh, how do you respond to youth's questions about time after death, especially in non-religious settings? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> oh gosh. Um... I, in tough questions like this, I'd like to punt it back to the kid. Well, what do you think? What have you heard? What have your parents shared? And in that, I'm punting the hot potato, yes. But I'm also trying to gather information. What have they heard? What did they think? What, what are they working with right now? What is, what's already in their brain? Because remember, a lot of times when kids ask these questions, they've already asked themselves and they've already been trying to do a little bit of mental gymnastic with themselves about what they think the answers are, right? So where's our, where's our, what's our starting point? And so it is punching a hot potato, but really I'm gathering um, uh, some information from them. And then from the material that they provide, maybe we can um, connect on that and go off on that. But that's a big, big question, right? And again, I'm less interested in giving them the answer because what do I know? What if my answer may not be what's good, right for them, right? Again, not imposing my own stuff, um, but it's more about gathering where they are, what have they heard, and let's seek some consultation, right? Many, many times I send kids to um, religious services and say, let's go talk to a spiritual advisor or a trusted adult. It could be someone from your religious community. Let's ask them how they understand this. Ask data collection, not let's ask them for the right answer. Let's gather information about how different people do things or think about it. And then you as a young person decide, how does this all land for you? And what's your version of all of this? It's dangerous to impose that there's only one right way. Um, so that's my, that's my roundabout answer to it. <laughs> there is a follow-up question in the chat. Um, no. What if you say there, there's just nothing after you die, that's just it? What is a good response to that? Oh. Hmm. Collect data from their lives. Ask them, have there been somebody that's been that's lost in your life? 
um, how do you, you know, how does your family, how does your home support think about that person even now, talk about that person even now? Um, I would collect some data from them. And I think this is a good reminder for parents and adults, how we model talking about death and dying to our, to our children. So when I talk to my, you know, there's a, there's a little altar in my house with my dad's picture. My kids go and say, good morning to grandpa in the morning. We say hi to grandpa after school. Part of their, you know, um, he's very much still in our lives. And that's how we talk about it. He physically here, no. But his spirit is. And at five and two, I, I think we're at a starting point of helping them understand that. And so when a person asks that, I would want to know, well, what messages have you gotten from your home turf about some of this? And hopefully there have been some modeling of, well, yeah, you know, my mom always talks about my grandma who died when she was, you know, and like, oh, so your grandma lives on. You still talk about grandma. Well, isn't that interesting? It's not just you're dead and they're gone. Sounds like in your family, you still remember people in your life, right? Like you throw it back on them and they can say, oh yeah, I guess it's not so black and white. Young people tend to think in very dichotomous ways. Is either this or is that? And what you're trying to help them understand is all the gray and the nuances that's between the black and the white. That's really beautiful. Yeah, thank you. It's similar, but... It's so Oh, I'm sorry, I just glanced over to the chat box and I love what um, Dennis Terry shared. You know, the true of the answer is we don't know. <laughs> I love that, right? The honesty of that. But we have to figure it for ourselves and I have some ideas. What are yours? Okay. You know, I talk about that with suicide um, when young people ask about suicide and death. And I said, you know, I can never interview anybody who suicide. I don't know. Was that a good idea? Do you regret it? How are you doing? I don't know. But what I do know is the impact it has on the people who they leave behind. What I do know is that, right? Then you start to help folks understand that, yeah, I don't know the answer to this, but here are the things that we do know we can talk about. So in a very similar way, Dennis, as you're saying, or Denise, or Dennis, um, let's the, the shift that. Yep, absolutely. Let the youth be the ones to to lead that conversation, right? Give them the space for that. Yeah. This is a, a, a similar question, uh, slightly, it's related. How do you address youth who feel their prayers, wishes, meditations, et cetera, et cetera, um, spiritual experiences did not work um, and uh, become rather disenchanted uh, who are questioning their family's uh, faith, or um, experience of religion? How do you uh, work with that in times of grief? Before answering that question, I have a lot more questions <laughs> for that person, for the youth, right? What do you mean it didn't work? What were you hoping it would do? What was your desired outcome? I don't know. I don't know the circumstance. Like, right, we need to collect more information, understand in what context are they feeling like it didn't work or was good enough? What does that mean? What would you have wanted to have happen? And to, to talk about that, it, you know, if, if the goal is that I would feel better and I don't feel grief anymore, that may be a wonderful opportunity for psychoeducation around what grief is. And that it, the goal is never to get rid of as we talked about in the very beginning of our conversation, but the goal is how to write it out and accept it and roll with it. Um, and so that may be important opportunity to talk with the young person about what are you hoping for and what didn't go your way and what is it that you need? You know, oftentimes something behind that is there's a, there's a need that wasn't met and they're pissed, <laughs> right? You told me to do these things and my needs will be met. Well, it didn't, it didn't work. Well, what were those needs? And are there other ways for us to meet that need? But if the need is to bring the person back, we, right? Then that's the part that you focus on. That's, that, that's the, the sadness and the, the still borrowing from the level, you know, the, the denial or the bargaining or the anger 
of like, why is there, or why are they gone? And I'm mad. I'm mad at um, the power above. I'm mad at, you know, that they didn't protect, didn't guarantee, they didn't. Then we work with that feeling. We may not be able to work with the outcome, but we can work with the emotions. What do you do when you're angry? What do you do when you're disappointed? What do you do when you're sad? In order to work with them, we have to listen underneath the words to what the emotions actually are and to, to hear them from the youth, which sometimes, you know, I'm hearing in your answers that um, more context is always helpful. Ask more questions, clarify, clarify, so that it can be heard underneath, if I'm getting you right. Yeah. And I think, in, in, especially when kids are starting to question their faith, we have to, as adults, um, and I talk to parents a lot about this, uh, we may get scared. Of like, oh my gosh, you're not going to go to church anymore. Or, oh my gosh, I don't believe in God anymore. Or, oh my gosh. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. This is your fear. This is your anxiety. This is your feeling like maybe you're losing some part of, right, of your family and what your rituals are. Hold on. Give them a minute. Give them a chance. Give them the flexibility to work through some of this and trust that some of this will kind of, they'll, they'll find their way. And again, I'm speaking to a, a group of more experts than I am about this, but I think when it comes to faith um, and spiritual life, we have different, we have waves with it throughout our lifetime. Times when we feel super, super connected, times when we do not. And then we go back into it in a different, right? Like it's not a once and done. It's not a box you check off. It's a lifelong journey. And that our, our, um, our spiritual system can stomach us doing a little bit of this <laughs> um, and not judge us or shame us for it. That is it's part of the journey. Yeah, absolutely. Are there any good books or resources for using your, your, your visual sense? Um, I'm thinking of children's books or other resources yeah. that would be good for yeah, young people who are going through a grieving process. I'm looking at my bookshelf now. Um, you know, there is, I'm gonna go get it. Hold on. <laughs> Remember how I said I like worksheets and all this? This is how my brain works. Um, so there's two books I wanna share and it, it really is, uh, again, some um, guiding principles, feels a, a psychological framework in a lot of what I talked about today. One is called Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, ACT, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. It's by Stephen Hayes. And this book is tight. It's not about grief. It's not about loss. It's about living value-driven lives. And the title of the book is Get Out of Your Mind and Into Your Life. And it's that idea of if you do what you what's important, valuable, purpose-driven for you, the byproduct of emotions. And I like this framework because it, 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 it helps to get the depressed person out of bed. And don't wait until you feel better to get out of bed. Get out of bed, get dressed, shower, show up, even if you don't like it in the moment because it feels odd, but it's important to you. Right. So I like this book a lot, and I reference it a lot in my work with young folks. There is a, also, again, drawing from ACT. This is Finding Life Beyond Trauma. Using acceptance and commitment therapy to heal from post-traumatic and trauma-related problems. Again, I think these are great but fundamental principles. Um, they are it's in lots of worksheets in here you can work, you can do with young folks. Again, this is not about grief and dying per se, but are all principles I think very applicable in all the things that we talked about today. So if some of the things that I said today kind of sits well with you or resonates somehow, you might really like acceptance commitment therapy. That's the principles I'm drawing from. Okay, it's called ACT, A-C-T. That's great, thank you. 
we pastors like our books. So those of us who are in that field enjoy finding some good resources like that. Um, one other question I had is we talked about giving young people something to do, and I really resonated with your story after your grandmother's death in Taiwan of you all gathering and, and making those beautiful lotus flowers. Is there, have you seen other examples of that um, where those of us, you know, in a church or in another community with young people experience a loss and we have these young people gathered together, they've come together it's not a memorial service. They have come together to be together, but need something to do. Can you give mm -hmm. us some ideas of what that might be? I think about the five, you know, using our five senses as a ref reference point. Are there things that you can see? Is there, is there a gallery? Is it visual? Is it a movie? Is it, what is, you know, maybe a visual? Um, could it be more tactile? Could it be arts and crafts that people can do? The thing about senses, um, I think about music, so what you hear. If kids can come together and create music, no words, sometimes words are very limiting, right? And in a moment of loss and grief, there's no good words, but there may be a good song. And so to think about music as a way to connect people can be really, really helpful. Um, we've had students, you know, paint giant murals. Um, so if you wanna do that in a community, that can be really helpful. Through song, it, it, could, it could be really helpful. Um, <laughs> we've had, I, I laugh because it's kind of silly, but you know, we sometimes, not silly, but we've had kids talk, we talk a lot about self-care, especially at a time of loss and grief um, and how important self-care is. And I remember one dorm, they, the, this is a dorm that had a loss by illness. Um, and they just like didn't face masks <laughs> one night. They all got together. We got them these face masks. That's what they wanted. And they did a little mani petty and face mask thing to as self care. And also it was what she was really into. You know, so it was a really, kind of a nod to something that she was into and that she would get a kick out of <laughs> if the whole dorm got face masks on and are doing, you know, manicures. Um, and then it was about taking care of themselves in that moment. So it could be something, not silly, but something like that, small. Adults, we sometimes think it's grand gestures, um, grand, big moments, big statements. For young people, you might be surprised that it's the little things. It's the little things that can, can really be helpful. Um, I'll tell you what I did with my team. And this has nothing to do with, well, I guess it does have to do with loss. When all of us came back together last year, you know, pandemic was still going on for sure, but it was our, we were coming back on campus. I have a team of seven, myself included. And my first department meeting with my team, we talked about the pandemic. We talked about what it's been like since we've been apart because we went remote. As soon as March hit, we all went remote and then we had summer and we all came back in person in the fall. So a lot happened in that, you know, six months from March to September. So we talked a lot about what that was like for us, how our family is doing, and how are we going to get ourselves ready for this new academic year. And, you know, it was a very, it was a good meeting. A lot of us were emotional about kind of what it's been like, how hard it is, how scared we were to go into the new academic year as helpers when we ourselves were just like trying to get our head on straight because our kids are back in school, our own children were getting back into school and were pulled from all different directions. Anyway, my story is too long. Um, but I did this thing called, um, what is your word? What is your word? I went around the room and I asked every member of my team, what is the word that is going to ground you, guide you, and that we're going to help each other live up to this year? Everybody took a moment and then we all ran and shared. And then we made a bracelet. I'll show you. You see, we each took, um, we each hammered in our word in our bracelet. And we've been wearing it since last fall. And I was really touched that when we came back together this fall, we're all wearing it still. <laughs> I didn't tell them they had to, right? But this, so my word was steady, S-T-E-A-D-Y. Because I had to remind myself 
as a clinician, as the director, that this storm was still going and my job was to hold steady. Hold steady for myself, hold steady for my team. Because the moments that I was the least proud of since the pandemic, with the moments when I was not steady and I was yelling at my children because I was frustrated by the third Zoom call that they've busted in and like, right? Ah! Um, don't worry, they're safe. They're from loving homes. <laughs> no mandated reporters out there. Um, but I wanted, I really needed to keep steady. I needed to remind myself that. So this is something that we talked about we did, we all literally hammered in letter by letter our word. And it was something that we then have a mutual language around. So throughout the year, and I said that we would do this, we would say, how's that word? What can I do to help, you know, anything I can do to make sure that you're living out that word. It becomes a common language between us that we can check in, talk about, and then it's kind of sweet when we go around, you know, to be all these meetings and you, you see your team wearing a bracelet just like you. Connection. And that connection can be so important for those of us in the helping professions because there is a fine line. Um, I, I wish we could take a break from this pandemic to get ourselves back on track and recalibrate ourselves and then get back into the work, but we can't. So we're in this together, um, experiencing it differently, but in it together. And thank you for that. That's really salient. Um, someone wrote, what was your question about the words that you asked? Oh, I said, um, what is the word of the year that's gonna keep you grounded, that you're gonna strive toward? And that's kind of, that's really gonna guide throughout the year ahead. Because we knew the storm was still coming. Thank you for that. Folks, that is, a, we have a minute and a half left, but that is a perfect, <laughs> perfect ending. And I will, um, I grant you an extra minute and a half of your day, but want to thank you all for attending. Uh, please keep in mind our upcoming events. Uh, our next is on November 3rd, where we are talking with Dr. Margaret Clark about emotionality. Please make the time for that if you're able. And Dr. Lee, thank you so much for this insight, for this wisdom, for all of the resources and for all of the, the tricks of the trade. We are so thankful to have had you in our midst. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much.